Are you struggling to pass the CPA exam? Did your review course fail to fit your learning style? I'm Darius Clark of I-75 CPA Review, the number one course supplement, where the right teacher makes all the difference. And if you didn't pass audit, you probably received a score report that looks something like this. You see this content area, number three, performing further procedures and obtaining evidence? Most candidates who don't pass audit are weaker here in number three. Mostly everybody does okay with Roman numeral one and number four, which is ethics and reporting. And you really have to focus here to get pushed over the top. It's these evidence gathering questions, along with some of these risk assessment questions too, which I'll do in a different video. But this video is gonna be all about evidence gathering. And we're gonna go over some multiple choice questions from Roman numeral three in the content area here that should increase your basic understanding when it comes to evidence gathering. Let's start with one on payroll. And all of the questions that we're going to go over are right out of the I-75 test bank. In the subsequent period, the independent auditor wants to quickly compare the gross payroll for the year under audit as reported to the government and compare it to the general ledger payroll figure. Which one form would quickly and accurately have such information? Well, it wouldn't be the W-2 because each employee gets a W-2 and you'd have to add all the employee W-2s and then compare it to the general ledger payroll figure. So if you want one form, W-2 is not going to do it. But W-3, that's the right answer because the W-3 has the totals of all the form W-2s. So the question's pointing to quickly comparing the general ledger payroll figure to one form, that's the W-3 form. That would be the reconciliation of the entire year's payroll. The gross pay for everybody would be on line one of form W-3. Wouldn't be the 941 because those are quarterly payroll tax forms and you'd have to get all four quarters together, add up the four quarters and then compare to the general ledger. And the question's comparing one form quickly and accurately to the general ledger. And it certainly wouldn't be 1099 because employees don't receive 1099s. So anything to do with a 1099 would be involved with independent contractors, not employees. So this next question is going to be on timing of audit procedures and specifically what procedures can be done before the balance sheet date and which have to be done after in what we call the subsequent period. So we're still with content area number three here, performing procedures and obtaining evidence which of the following audit procedures is not likely performed prior to the balance sheet date. A says testing internal controls. Testing controls is very likely to be performed prior to the balance sheet date because it's a procedure that can be done any time during the year. So an audit firm would not likely save it for the subsequent period when they can do it at interim dates anytime during the year. So testing controls would likely be performed prior to the balance sheet date. Observing client inventory, letter C, that can be done anytime as long as risks of material misstatement is assessed to be low. So if the client maintains perpetual inventory records and the risk of misstatement is low, the auditor can observe inventory prior to the balance sheet date. Confirming receivables can be performed before, at, or after year end. Once again, if client controls are good, if the client controls aren't good, then we'll confirm receivables close to the balance sheet date. The only audit procedure we really can't perform prior to the balance sheet date is obtain a management rep letter. Why? Because the management rep letter is the final piece of evidence and you're not going to get the final piece of audit evidence before the balance sheet date. The final piece of audit evidence will be obtained sometime in the subsequent period. Remember, the management rep letter is where the auditor makes inquiries to management. Management answers the auditor's inquiries the auditor writes down all of management's responses and then presents it back to management in writing at the very end of the audit and says, here's all the inquiries we made. Here's all your answers. Please sign this. And if they sign the management rep letter, it means the auditor has more confidence in management's responses to the inquiries. So the answer here is obtaining management representations that will happen after the balance sheet date and not before. Now, this third question deals with specific terminology that the exam expects you to know regarding audit evidence. 
For example, what's the difference between inspection, observation, what does confirmation mean? Which of the following auditor substantive tests is an example of inspection? Now, I want you to think of inspection as something that the client's already done that the auditor is going to look at. And observation, on the other hand, is something that the client's doing right now that the auditor is going to look at. So how about A, auditor examines invoices to support additions to fixed assets during the year. So looking at invoices that are already been done to support fixed assets, that's inspection. B, auditor observes accounting clerk recording daily deposit of cash receipts. That's something going on right now. That's observation, not inspection. Auditor sends external communications to client vendors requesting direct responses. That's confirmation, not inspection, not observation. Letter C is confirmation. D, auditor compares this year's sales to last year's sales and investigates unusual fluctuations. That's an analytical procedure. That's not inspection. So again, inspection involves the auditor looking at something that the client's already performed where observation is the auditor looking at something the client's doing right now. So we just did three multiple choice questions about audit evidence. Would you have gotten those three questions right five minutes ago? Hopefully you took a couple of notes as we were going over them so that when you see it again, you'll be able to recognize, attack, and move on, what I call the RAM method. Because you gotta answer these questions in less than a minute. Now this next question is a substantive procedure, a two directional test. And the exam likes to ask, where does the auditor start the test and where does the auditor go next? Jay CPA is auditing Palmer Corp, a non-issuer. If Jay's objective is to detect the overstatement of sales, Jay should trace Palmer's transactions from the what? So in these questions on two directional testing, they'll often ask, where does the test start? And then where does the auditor go from there? In this case, you're trying to detect overstatement. Where do you start the test? Well, you would always begin a test for overstatement with the books and records, never the supporting documents. So we're gonna start with the books and records, see what was recorded in the sales journal in this case, because we're looking for the overstatement of sales. And then we'll see if what was recorded as a sale in the sales journal really should have been recorded. And we'll know by looking for the shipping documents, because for every recorded sale, there should be a shipping document. And if you find a recorded sale in the sales journal where no shipping document can be found, you got yourself an overstatement of sales. And that hits the occurrence, existence occurrence assertion for sales. So A is right, B is wrong. Shipping documents to the cash receipts journal, no, that's only gonna tell you whether what was shipped out was ever collected. C, cash receipts journal to the customer's purchase orders. No, if you start with what was collected in cash and go to the customer's purchase orders, another term for that would be the sales order. The company's sales order would be the same as the customer's purchase order. If you start with the cash receipts journal and then look for the customer's purchase order, you're looking for evidence that what was collected was actually from a sale. And that might help you if your objective was to detect overstatement of cash but not overstatement of sales. D, customer's purchase orders to the sales journal. So starting with the customer purchase order, that's the first document in the sales cycle, also known as the sales order. If you go from there to the sales journal, then you're looking to make sure that everything that was ordered was ultimately recorded as a sale. And if not, then possibly that would detect an understatement of sales, but it also could detect a failed transaction where somebody ordered something but it never came in so it was never recorded. So D's not gonna help you detect overstatement of sales. For overstatement of sales, the auditor would begin with what was presumed to have taken place. Sales were recorded in a sales journal, start there, and then go to find the evidence that it really should have been recorded. Look for shipping documents. And if you need more help with audit evidence or any part of the audit exam, go to cpaexamtutoring.com and get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, where the right teacher makes all the difference.